The Great Depression was clearly a traumatic and a shock to the confidence uh, of the nation. Uh, out of the crisis um, emerged probing criticisms of American society and the American corporate capitalist economy. At the same time, uh, the Great Depression confirmed some traditional values and reinforced many traditional goals. Uh, there was therefore not one Great Depression uh, culture, but many. Uh, prosperity and industrial growth uh, had done much to shape American values in the 1920s. Culture celebrated affluence and consumerism and expressed the importance of personal gratification through each of those things. You would assume that the Great Depression would have had a huge effect on American social values, you know, kind of in the opposite direction. In general, however, American social values seemed to change little in response to the Great Depression. Rather, people responded by redoubling their commitment to familiar ideas and goals. Sociologists Robert and Helen Merrill Lind, uh, remember sociology was a fairly new science, uh, invented essentially at the University of Chicago by the, um, uh, the, the people that, um, that worked with um, Jane Addams at Hull House. Uh, and they wrote a, a study based on uh, the, the mid-1920s, uh, uh, their study of, it, of Muncie, Indiana, sort of a middle American town. The study was called Middletown. Uh, it came out in 1929. And after the Depression hit, they went back and in 1937 wrote uh, and published Middletown in Transition. Sort of, let's see how things have changed. And curiously, they found that Middletown was living by the values by which it lived in 1925. There was a strong remaining commitment to the traditional American emphasis on the individual. Now, no assumption would seem to have been more vulnerable to erosion during the Great Depression than the belief that the individual was in control of his own fate, that anyone displaying sufficient talent and energy could, would be successful. You would think this uh, Gilded Age ideology, self-made man stuff, would have eroded pretty badly, but it didn't. And to some degree, the crisis did undermine the American success ethic. Many looked to the government for relief and blamed the economic royalist, quote-unquote, for their problems. Yet the Great Depression did not, in, in the end, seriously erode the success ethic. ethic. Uh, the survival of the ideals of work and individual advance, advancement was evident in many ways, not least in the reactions of those most traumatized, conscientious working people who suddenly found themselves unemployed. Some expressed anger at the system, but the vast majority seemed to blame themselves. Foreign observers were particularly uh, stunned by this apparent uh, passivity of the unemployed, many of whom were too ashamed to leave their homes. This would not have been a French reaction. You know, Frenchmen would have been out in the streets uh, protesting. Now, um, <clears throat> so uh, rather than... Um, erode uh, the success ethic. People doubled down on, on the um, uh, self-made man. At the same time, millions responded eagerly to reassur reassurances that they could, through their own efforts, restore their prosperity and success. Dale Carnegie, uh, sort of this motivational leader, uh, wrote this book called How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, in 1936. It's a self-help manual and one of the best-selling books of the decade. In fact, one of the best-selling books uh, of the 20th century. You can still go to Barnes & Noble right now and buy a copy of it. Uh, <clears throat> we can talk about this more in class, but it's, it's in, incredibly enduring. Carnegie's message was, personal, personal initiative is not the only route to success. It was also, it, it was also that uh, the best way for people to make something of themselves was to adapt to the world in which they lived, understand the values and expectations of others, and mold yourself accordingly. Win friends and influence people. Uh, similarly, similarly, a Protestant minister named uh, Harry Emerson, Emerson Fostick uh, preached the power of positive thinking and individual initiative to large radio audiences, wildly popular. <clears throat> now, just as many progressives were alarmed when they, when they discovered, quote-unquote, uh, profound urban poverty in the early 20th century, recall Jacob Reese's photo essay, How the Other Half Lives, um, Many Americans in the Depression were shocked to learn of the extent of rural poverty. Um, this poverty was conveyed by documentary photographers, uh, many employed by the uh, Farm Security Administration. And these people uh, traveled through the South and recorded agricultural life. The most famous is Dorothea Lange. Here she is on the left, uh, out on the road. And uh, this picture she took on the right is 
I'll start to say one of them. It's, it's the most iconic image of the Great Depression. It's called Migrant Mother. Um, it's a, a migrant worker, one of these camps, uh, and she's clearly an attractive woman, but uh, her face is very worn. She's got these scared kids. Clothes are kind of torn. Um, she, she very much is like Julia Dunn in, in the novel we're reading to me. Uh, and so uh, Lang and others' works sort of exposed just how desperate things were uh, in the rural South and, and, and Midwest um, through photojournalism. Many writers uh, wrote exposés of, of social injustice. Um, uh, stuff flourished, obviously, at the time. Erskine Caldwell wrote uh, Tobacco Road, 1932. It's a book and a long-running Broadway play about poverty in the rural South. Richard Wright, uh, a very, very important uh, African-American novelist, exposed the plight of those in the urban ghetto in Native Son. came out in 1940. Uh, John Steinbeck's novels, obviously, uh, portrayed the plight of migrants and workers in California. Uh, playwright Clifford Odette's play, Waiting for Lefty, uh, showed the appeal of political radicalism. Um, but the cultural products that attracted the widest attention were those that diverted Americans' attention away from the Great Depression, talking about movies and radio. Almost every family uh, had a radio in the 1930s. They had been introduced in the 1920s. It was like a common piece of furniture in a house. Um, even in rural areas without electricity, many families bought radios and hooked them up to the car battery when they wanted to listen. Radio listening was usually a private activity, but in some communities it was also a community activity. Young people would put radios on the porch and invite friends over to sit, listen, or dance. In poor urban areas, people would congregate on a street or in a backyard to listen to a sporting event. Although radio stations occasionally carried socially and politically provocative material, most programming was escapist. Um, comedies like Amos and Andy or adventures like Superman, Dick Tracy, and The Lone Ranger. Here on the right we see uh, The Lone Ranger, uh, a radio actor getting into character. Radio brought a new kind of comedy, previously limited to vaudeville, the ethnic theater, to a broader audience. Uh, jokes and repartee from the likes of George Burns and Gracie Allen. Um, or uh, Jack Benny and others. Um, soap operas also starred on the radio and were hugely popular in the 1930s. Uh, these were complicated stories of intrigue, romance, betrayal, usually without overt social or political messages. They were called soap operas, by the way, because they were most often sponsored uh, by soap products um, initially. The commercials were about soap products. Um, almost all of these programs were broadcast live, Sp uh, spawning public performances, since they were often performed before live audiences. Uh, even classical music was broadcast. NBC actually created a full symphony orchestra under the conductorship of a distinguished Italian just for this purpose. Uh, radio gave Americans their first direct access to public events, and radio news and sports divisions grew rapidly to meet demand. Memorable broadcasts included the Hindenburg disaster in 1937, uh, which ended uh, airship travel. And Orson Welles, uh, Halloween broadcast in 1938 about aliens landing in New Jersey and marching on uh, New York City with terrible weapons. And, of course, a lot of people believed it and uh, panicked. Radio was very important for two reasons. It created the possibility of shared experience uh, and common access to culture and information uh, in a way that uh, you find easy to understand with social media, but uh, people before the 1930s would not have understood. And it changed the social life of the nation, encouraging families to center their family life around their home uh, more than they had in the past. Uh, next time we'll talk about uh, the movies. <laughs>